Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Rohan. I'm a fifth year medical student studying at the University of Cambridge. Today, I'm gonna to tell you how I achieved a first class degree here at Cambridge. Obviously, it's not possible to cover everything in one video, but I'll be sharing some high leverage principles which you can start implementing today when studying for exams. And these are things which I found really helpful when I was preparing for exams. The first few points are about mindset. Please don't skip these because these are probably some of the most important tips which I'll be giving in this video. We shouldn't underestimate the effect that psychology and our brain can have on our life and indeed in our exam performance. Point number one is to pick the pursuit intentionally. By this I mean really try to work out if getting a first is going to be a priority for you in your life and whether it's worth it. This might be a bit of a novel concept because at school we're pretty much conditioned to aim to the highest grades possible because the higher grades you get the more likely you are to get into your chosen university or your chosen course. But at university, sometimes the top grades don't necessarily guarantee you to be more employable compared to someone who does, for example, extra research or internships or other things outside of their course. So basically what I'm trying to say is don't just stumble into your way into this pursuit of getting a first because it is quite a lot of work. You need to decide what your priorities are going to be at from the start. Some ways you can do this is by talking to older students or mentors. You could also journal your thoughts and your ideas. For me, I've always wanted to do well academically because in one way it was to honor my parents because when they were at university, they worked really hard and they got prizes and awards. And even now they work really hard to ensure that we have enough money and resources to able to go to university. And second, kind of this pursuit of doing as well as I can in the exams has really given me confidence and helped me kind of push away imposter syndrome because kind of doing well in the exams acts as a positive reinforcement loop. So this leads on to our next point about imposter syndrome and not letting it limit your ambitions. If you don't know, imposter syndrome is basically feeling that you don't fit in or that you don't deserve to be in that place, for example, your chosen course at university. It's a pretty universal feeling. Pretty much everyone at some point in their careers feel a sense of imposter syndrome, and I was definitely no different. Some advice in general about imposter syndrome, don't believe in the lies. I mean, of course you deserve to be there. You were picked and chosen to be in university because the admissions tutors picked your application based on its merits, and the admissions tutors think you have every chance of succeeding in the course to the same extent of those around you. Another high leverage point is to adopt a growth mindset. This is a term called by Carol Dweck, and it's basically how we respond to setbacks. This is because we will all inevitably face setbacks at some point in our academics, but it's how we respond to them is what separates people. People with a fixed mindset have the attitude that a setback or a low score in a test or an essay is kind of like, I'm not good at essays or I'm not good at the subject. Whereas people with a growth mindset view these challenges as an opportunity to learn. And this isn't just some random hack, it's actually been proven in rigorous scientific studies and even in neuroimaging studies. One way in which I applied this was in first year anatomy. We used to have these little mock tests in the dissection room a few times each term. On the first one, it was a test of upper limb anatomy and I did okay, but I only got about 60%. Whereas most of my peers were scoring 70% and above. And instead of just thinking that anatomy is not one of my strongest subjects, I tried to analyze why I was doing worse than the others because I knew I was putting in equal effort. And I realized that I was studying wrong and I was just learning the theory of anatomy rather than appreciating how each structure looks like in real life and the spatial links between each of the different structures. This completely changed my approach to anatomy and I began to use clinical atlases with photographs of real life specimens. And towards the end of the year in these little mock tests, I was consistently getting 80 or 90%. This leads nicely onto our next point, which is to learn how to study early on in your course. Each year comes with different subjects and a different set of challenges. What strategy work for some years may not work for others. So to find out what will best work for you, I recommend making friends with those in years above and listen to how they approach the year. They're the best people to ask because they've just gone through what you're about to go through and they've also had time to reflect and think which things worked for them and which things didn't and what things they'd do better if they had another shot at it. So every year about this time, I spam a few trusted friends in the years above asking for their advice and just getting their wisdom on what things I should be focusing on, what their best resources were they recommend, and so on. And even I have done a few long form videos on advice for first and second year medics, which you can check out on my channel. Once you've kind of interviewed a few people and you 
have a list of different things people did, it's time to pick a strategy and commit to it. I would avoid like mixing and matching strategies too much. So like one day doing notes and another day doing mind maps because you're not really giving each strategy enough time to see whether it actually works. The best way to identify what works best for you is by treating your mock exams like the real exam. Prepare thoroughly for them so you know whether what you've done is effective or not. I'll quickly go over some of the things that's worked for me over the years. At the start, I recommend prioritizing understanding over rote memorization. This is because in the long run, understanding the content will help you to memorize it faster and it'll just help you answer the questions better. To enhance my understanding, basically, in the first pass of my content, I would go through it really slowly and I'd really try to think if what the lecturer was saying made sense or not. If it didn't make sense, I would try to look things up and work things out for myself, or I'd try to make a little summary out of a paragraph, for example, in the lecture handout. If the lecture was in person, hopefully I would have done some pre-reading so I can understand the lecture better. But even if not, I will make sure to read the lecture material afterwards. And if I still didn't understand things, I'd make a note of it and take my doubts to the lecturer at the next lecture, or I'd take it to my supervisor and ask the questions there. And actually I used to keep an Apple Notes document where I just used to list all the questions I had for all the different subjects I was taking and bring it to each supervision. And this is to make sure I was really plugging any gaps in my understanding as we went along. If I was looking at an online lecture, for example, and it was one hour, I'd actually spend a total of probably two hours of looking at it. And this is because I'd often pause the lecture and then review the lecture materials at the same time and see whether this made sense. And I'd also use that opportunity to make active recall questions on a separate document, which served as an excellent revision tool for me later down the line when I was trying to memorize the lectures. The next phase for me was learning the content and the smaller details once I had the big picture in my head. For this, I'm sure you know what two techniques I'm gonna recommend. And yes, you're right, that's active recall and spaced repetition. In general, Anki flashcards were a really good way of incorporating incorporating these two tools, but sometimes these did get a bit overwhelming and there was flashcard overload, which is why I liked having these documents of active recall questions and color coding them based on how well I knew something. For the active recall, I would implement this by kind of mentally rehearsing the answer to the question and trying to recall it from the lecture materials. If I was more disciplined or I had more energy, I'd actually get a scrap piece of paper and try to jot down all the answers to the actual recall questions. I used to call this making scribble notes as they weren't formal notes and they went straight in the bin. And that's another recommendation I find, particularly for medicine, is I wouldn't bother making notes just because lecture handouts themselves are quite detailed and fairly comprehensive. I think that making notes is a bit too time consuming and yeah, it's not a very high yield strategy for learning. At least that's in my opinion. Opinion. Some people do very well with making lecture notes, so it's really up to you to assess what works best for you. One important thing is to try enjoy the process as much as you can. And this will enable you to study even when your motivation is waning. For example, this year, I used a website called PassMed extensively, and this helped me score really highly in my fourth year written paper. The reason why I liked it so much is because studying became like a video game. So basically I was answering these questions from an online question bank every day and it had good statistics on your average score for questions split by different speciality, your score compared to the average PassMed user. And it almost became like a game of trying to improve my average score and you know, compare my score versus other people in Cambridge. And the game became to try push my score as far to the right of the bell curve as possible. And I know some things are harder to make fun. For example, I think like writing essays is just more challenging or making plans for them. But one way which Andrew Huberman suggested, and I know I mention him a lot, but his podcast is amazing. One thing which he suggests is to really try find something interesting within that subject or just deep dive into something, even it might be a bit off topic or tangential, not really related to your course. Try find something that really interests you. For example, a new concept. I don't know, I forgot what example Huberman used in his actual podcast, but pretend it was like geography and like he was really interested in the different formation of different rocks. You could use this to kind of just try to develop a passion for the subject itself. So then you're having intrinsic motivation and you're actually enjoying the process rather than only doing it for the end result, for example for a good exam result. The next bit is to understand how to utilize the past papers. Now, we all know that past papers are the most effective way to study for exams. And here's what I did to get the most out of them. First is to start them earlier than you think. There's this fallacy that exists that, oh, I need to learn the content 
before going through the past papers. And although you need to know some stuff to be able to give the past paper a good shot, doing the past papers earlier than you potentially feel comfortable actually accelerates the learning process. I would even recommend right at the start of your course, just skimming through some of the past papers, what types of questions seem to come up, what formats there are, and try to determine what might be high yield content for you to go away and prioritize. Medicine is so vast, so it's really hard to actually go through all the conditions in detail. And often we learn it to more detail than is actually necessary or we don't emphasize the correct things when we're studying. Whereas when you're doing these online questions, which are written in a very similar style to most medical school exams, this is the closest style of thing which you're actually gonna face in the real exams. So in my opinion, trying to maximize the amount of this practice really helped me to nail the written paper. With the past papers, try to emulate exam conditions as far as possible. So do the paper in one sitting, taking your start time and your end time. Don't listen to music or peek at your notes when doing the paper. And I took this to the extreme during my third year finals. So in third year, we had these five hour online exams. So I ended up actually doing a five hour mock for each of my modules because I knew I had to build up stamina to be able to write three complex essays back to back to back. So 1,500 word essays. And even like other things which might not be related to the subject itself. For example, how do you maintain sufficient energy levels through your nutrition so that you can get through five hours without your energy levels dipping or waning? These were all things I considered to try prepare myself as best I could when it came to exam. One hack I found useful when using the past papers is by prioritizing to do them in the afternoons. Because I have this mentality of mock tests being really important, once I start a test, I'm usually pretty good at completing it because I know these past papers, they are our most useful resource, so I don't want to waste them. So what I do when my motivation is higher in the morning, I do some more kind of mundane, boring studying, which I had less motivation for. For example, just kind of learning the content or trying to make more essay plans, uh, read more papers. And then in the afternoon, I would do the mock exam in time conditions. And then once I'd finished the paper and then marked it and then noted down all my mistakes, that was pretty much me done for the day. And this format really worked for me. The final point is to study consistently throughout the academic year. This is because doing a consistent amount of work over a longer period of time is more sustainable than doing everything in the last month or two before the exam. Now, it's inevitable that you will end up working more in the weeks and months leading up to the exam. That's completely natural. But those those who work consistently over the whole academic year, they naturally have an advantage over those who haven't because they've had longer time for the concepts to be embedded into their mind and also to leverage space repetition. So they're more likely to retain what they learn even in the months leading up to exam. Dr. Shane, who's an ex-Cambridge medic, has made an excellent video on how to have a sustainable study routine and the balance of working hard versus working smart. So I'll leave a link to that video. What I'll try to add to what he said is to try refine your daily routine as much as possible. So studying becomes a bit more of a habit rather than something you have to force yourself to do. You'll see that from my study vlogs that I have a very similar morning routine. I eat similar things at similar times of the day. These things might seem boring, but they all serve as a cue for me and for my brain to understand when it's time to be working and focusing and when it's time to relax. I also recommend that you have some non-negotiable habits, which you stick to even during peak exam season. These will help you to work sustainably so that you don't burn out. For me, that's sleeping seven to eight hours a night and in the mornings reading my Bible and praying and also doing one form of exercise every day. I also like talking to my parents and then my grandparents in India, just because, just to get any advice from them and also they have a more relaxed perspective kind of on life. And hopefully through my vlogs and also by the fact that I have this YouTube channel that you can see it is possible to have a decent work-life balance and still go for that first if that's your aim. Okay, that brings us to the end of the video. To summarize, we've talked about the mindsets to adopt if you're aiming for a first and to be intentional with your goals and for eliminating imposter syndrome. Then we discussed the importance of learning how to learn early on and a specific way I went about understanding concepts and then memorizing them. We also talked about past papers and how you can best use them. And finally, we discussed the importance of being consistent throughout the year in your studies. Before we wrap up, I want to make a disclaimer 
And I put this at the end of the video because I know if I put it at the start, people will probably click off. And it's, I don't want this video to make it portray that I'm arrogant or superior to others. That's definitely not the case. And I've made so many mistakes and there's been so many disappointments along the way, even in my academics. I've actually waited for over a year to make this video. So I got the first class degree at the end of third year. And now it's just the start of fifth year because I really wanted to make sure I was reflecting on the whole process to make sure what I was saying was actually good and useful. And another thing is to try not to be disappointed even if the exams don't go as you hope. I know it's easier said than done and it's probably healthy that you do have a brief period of disappointment if your result doesn't go your way just because it shows that you actually cared about the process. And remember that a lot of these essays exams are quite subjective and what one examiner might give a mid 2-1, another examiner would give a first class and if you remark it, that might give you a different mark. So there is some luck involved but as one of my old chess coaches would say, he said that you make your own luck. And this motto has been a really good source of comfort for me through all the ups and downs and all the challenges I've faced. Because I know so long as I put the effort in and do the hard work, then things will eventually turn out for the good. So anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you found any value in this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. You might also want to check out this video, which is the essay structure which I use, which helped me to write first class essays. But anyway, take care and bye for now.